Hello everybody, my name is Martin Jarrett and I am a Senior Research Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. Today I would like to give you an introduction on some recent research that I have been conducting on this topic here, ISDS 2.0 time for a doctrine of precedent question mark. The first thing that I need to do is give you some background and also an introduction to the core research question that I'm interested in. So let's turn to that matter first and we can start with the reform process for ISDS. Uh, since about 2005, although I admit that's a very arbitrary designation, uh, there has been a well-documented backlash against investor state dispute settlement. And in light of that backlash in 2017, a reform process for IASDS was initiated at UNSER trial. And you can actually see in this document here, and we'll zoom in on it, the original mandate for the work. What we're really interested in is that part that is underlined down the bottom there. I'll paraphrase it. It says, as a first step, the reform process that UNSER trial is about to begin should begin with identifying the underlying issues and concerns with investor state dispute settlement. Now, one of the very first issues that was identified was a lack of consistency in arbitral jurisprudence. In other words, different arbitral tribunals were giving different interpretations to similarly worded treaty provisions in investment treaties. By 2018, uh, the UNSA trial working group that was working on the reform of ISDS started to float some ideas on how this problem could be solved. And we are interested in number five, just here, introducing or implementing a system of stare decisis, or what I call a doctrine of precedent. These two, these two terms, stare decisis and a doctrine of precedent, I consider them to be synonyms, but I prefer doctrine of precedent. So I'll use that expression going forward. I want to investigate this possible solution to the problem of inconsistency, particularly because the UNSA trial working group has not made a final determination on what their solution will be to the matter. So the research question that I will ask is looking at you straight in the face there. Should a doctrine of precedent be adopted into ISDS 2.0? One question that you might ask is, well, what is this ISDS 2.0? And it's simply my code name for the reformed version of investor state dispute settlement, i.e. The, the new version of ISDS that should, that should sorry, emerge from the reform process. To answer this research question, we need to proceed through three sub questions. The first one is, legally speaking, can a doctrine of precedent be adopted into ISDS 2.0? Second question down there, is it practically possible? And the third one is, is there a good normative case for its adoption? We're going to proceed through each of these three questions. Before I get to them, however, I briefly need to make sure that we have a common understanding of what a doctrine of precedent is. So let me briefly take a detour into that matter and then we'll come back to the analysis. It will not take long. I just want to explain that when I think of a doctrine of precedent, I think of the doctrine of precedent as it is operative in English law. So that kind of bangs, sorry, that rather, that begs the question, how does the doctrine of precedent operate in English law? And well, you can see in front of you there, the leading work on the topic, precedent in English law. The authors say this about the English doctrine of precedent. And I'm going to, you can see, zoom in and highlight this part here. Judicial precedent has some persuasive effect almost everywhere because stare decisis, keep to what has been decided previously, is a maxim of practically universal application. The peculiar feature of the English doctrine of precedent is its strongly coercive nature. English judges are sometimes obliged to follow a previous case, although they have what would otherwise be 
good reasons for not doing so. So very concisely, a legal system can be said to have a doctrine of precedent when its adjudicators are under an obligation to follow precedents as opposed to merely having the habit of following them, which as the text just said, is a feature of pretty much every legal system. Now, is this something that we want to see in ISDS 2.0? Do we want adjudicators to be under an obligation to follow precedents? Let's get into the analysis now and answer the question. The first question that has to be addressed in order to get to the bigger one, should there be a doctrine of precedent is, would the operation of a doctrine of precedent in ISDS 2.0 be legal in international law? And in answering this question, the ground rule is this one right here. The legality of adopting a doctrine of precedent is a matter that will be governed by the treaty creating ISDS 2.0's Joe. So just as, as an example, if there are provisions to the effect in that treaty that the adjudicators of ISDS 2.0 have to follow precedents, then a doctrine of precedent will be created. Alternatively, if there are provisions to the effect that adjudicators must not follow precedents, then there cannot be a doctrine of precedent. My assumption is that the topic will be totally left alone um, and there will be no provisions in the treaty on the use of precedent. This gives rise to this question here. Are there other rules of international law which, through the principle of systemic integration, might prohibit the adoption of a doctrine of precedent in ISDS 2.0? The answer is potentially a, a yes, and we can get there perhaps via the statute of the International Court of Justice. You can see, and we'll zoom in here for a closer inspection, and I'll underline the parts that I'm going to talk about in Article 38D, Judicial decisions only have the status of subsidiary means for determining the rules of international law. And because they only have this subsidiary status, you might be able to read in an implicit prohibition here on the adoption of doctrines of precedent in international law. I have seen that, um, that type of argument in the scholarship. Honestly, however, I don't think it's a very strong argument. I don't see how anyone can come to that interpretation looking at those words. I do think, however, there is a stronger argument that Article 59 might contain an implicit prohibition. You can see down the bottom of your, of your screen there. It reads that the decision of a court has no binding force except between the parties. And, and this is the really important part here, in respect of that particular case. Looking at these words here, if a decision can only have legal effect in respect of one particular case, then that might mean that a doctrine of precedent is excluded by this provision because the whole idea of a doctrine of precedent is to give decisions legal effect beyond the cases that they actually decide. But here is the thing about Article 59. The word decision does not refer to the reasoning that an adjudicator uses to resolve the relevant legal dispute. Rather, it only refers to the operative part of the judgment. Now, considering that precedents come from the legal reasoning, that means that Article 59 is ultimately not problematic. I cannot say the same thing about this issue, however. What about the fragmented nature of international investment law? You might be able to reason as follows. You could say that each treaty must be interpreted according to its own terms. There are thousands of investment treaties, therefore a doctrine of precedent simply isn't possible in international investment law. There is uh, quite a lot of truth to this argument, but it is important to recognize that the content of investment treaties is very similar. And in some cases, it's exactly the same. So while I recognize that there is the potential for this factor to inhibit the adoption of a doctrine of precedent, for now, 
So long as the content of investment treaty stays very similar, I think that its potential is rather limited. Let's move on to the next issue. Is the adoption of a doctrine of precedent in ISDS 2.0 practical? Are the, are the practical elements in place to make this adoption possible? I see that there are four necessities that we need to have in place here. The first one is you need case reporting, which we have in international investment law. The second one is a little bit more complex. Uh, you need vague rules because if you have vague rules, then those rules need to be interpreted, which is another way of saying that you need the adjudicators to add more content to the law. Now, this is ordinarily the case with, with all rules. Uh, rules, generally speaking, need some kind of interpretation in order to be applied to the relevant facts of the case. But vague rules obviously need more interpretation. In other words, they need more adjudicator made law to, to work properly. Now, keep in the back of your mind this issue of the certainty of law. We all agree that we need certainty of law in order for a legal system to, to operate properly. If you don't have a doctrine of precedent and you have lots of adjudicator made law, then the content of law becomes less stable because there's always the chance that the you know this big chunk of adjudicator made law can change a doctrine of precedent fixes this issue it, it it says at its core precedents have to be followed as you probably know international investment law international investment treaties are, are made up of very vague provisions meaning there has to be a lot of adjudicator made law in international investment law so that is another one that we have in place. Third, you need an appellant apparatus to make sure that there is one court at the, the top of the system to enforce precedence on all the other courts in the system. Now, one of the key and distinctive features of ISDS 2.0 is that it should have an appellant tier. So we have all three of these, we can give them a big tick. The fourth one, however, is a little bit up in the air. It's what I call a, a reverence to, to precedent. It's well illustrated, hopefully, by this photo you can see here of the man uh, bowing down to the law reports. Obviously, this is not a feature of the current system of ISDS, and it is an outstanding question whether this attitude of reverence will develop among the adjudicators of ISDS 2.0. So, we have to put a question mark here. But before moving on, it should be noted that whether this attitude of reverence to precedent actually develops will depend on whether the adjudicators in this new system see value in adopting a doctrine of precedent, which dovetails very nicely into this question here. Should a doctrine of precedent be adopted into ISDS? 2.0. This is our next question and here is what I think should be the decision calculus for this question. First factor in there is certainty. Very fundamentally a doctrine of precedent should bring more certainty regarding the content of a particular body of law such as international investment law. With that increased certainty certain efficiency benefits should flow from there, such as reduced litigation slash more out of court settlements, uh, or you can also have reduced error costs. In other words, the situation where an appellant court has to strike down a decision from a lower court because the lower court has incorrectly applied the law. Those efficiency gains have to be weighed against a cost, namely the unfairness that might follow in a case where a judge has to apply a precedent. You can legitimately go either way on this issue, although I have to say I tend to favour the efficiency gains because I worry that when people speak about the problem of a decision being unfair on account of a precedent, what they are really saying is that the decision does not accord with their own personal values, which is a really nice introduction to the second factor, adjudicative freedom. A doctrine of precedent, it can eliminate the personal biases of adjudicators. On the other hand, we have to admit that 
when judges are selected to serve on certain courts, one of the reasons why they might be selected is on account of personal factors that they bring to the bench. A doctrine of precedent, it, it tries to eliminate the influence of these personal factors, which uh, personally, I find really appealing, although I can understand that others may not. And the third and final factor that we need to think about is that a doctrine of precedent turns mere interpretations of treaty provisions into much harder binding law. I think what you can say here is that a doctrine of precedent makes interpretations into real adjudicator made law. And this raises the following question, which even Denzel Washington has apparently been contemplating. What is the source of this lawmaking power? Well, you could say that when states create an international court, they implicitly give it the power to engage in, in some type of lawmaking. But what happens if that power is used to create bad precedents? In other words, precedents that the, that the state to the relevant investment treaty that has been uh, interpreted and, a, 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 and a, a precedent has been created for, what happens if those treaty parties look at the precedent and all of them say, we do not like this precedent? Well, this is where states need to use their option to issue joint interpretations of treaty provisions. This is a really big topic, one that I cannot cover in detail. I do recognize, however, that the practice of issuing joint interpretations is rather difficult. And this is, I think, one of the, the challenges going forward is that institutions need to be created around ISDS 2.0 that allow states to come together, discuss precedents, and in cases where they see that these precedents are objectionable, have the possibility to strike them down. And the good news is uh, there are efforts underway to make sure that such institutions will be built. This brings me to my concluding thoughts. The basic issue was this, should a doctrine of precedent be adopted into ISDS 2.0? My general feeling is yes, it should be. I do recognise that there will be difficulties in order to make it happen, but nonetheless, my conclusion is that yes, it definitely should be. As a quick recap, we made three findings. The first one was this one here. A doctrine of precedent would be legally feasible in ISDS 2.0, although we do have to recognise that the fragmented nature of international investment law might limit the application of any such doctrine of precedent. The second finding that we made is that the practical elements are in place except this elusive reverence to, to precedent. And whether that reverence rather actually develops in the future will depend in large part on whether the adjudicators of ISDS 2.0 see that there is a good normative argument in favour of adopting a doctrine of precedent, which after going through the factors, I have to say, I think that there is a good normative argument for it. So those are my thoughts on this big issue, but as always, I'm really interested to hear yours. So if you want to leave a comment below, I'll be sure to come back to you and hopefully we can continue this important conversation. Until then, many thanks for your attention.